My name is Marta Alberti and I am the Indoors Meeting Secretary for the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tyne. The Society was founded in 1813 and is the second oldest antiquarian society in the country. Since then, we have been meeting once a month to discuss the history and archaeology of the north of England and beyond. Our relationship with Newcastle University is a very happy and long-standing one. And once a year, we cooperate to produce a joint insights lecture. The lecture you're about to listen to is by Nick Owen and was delivered in 2016. It deals with three landscapes designed by landscape architect and eminent Northumbrian Lancelot Capability Brown. Owen describes Brown's character as one able to inspire both awe and a kind of fear, as it can be seen in the copious notes that his foreman took as he spoke and then applied to the gardens. The highlight of this lecture is the beautiful pictures, lithographs and sketches by the author, which aim to portray the landscapes that Capability Brown would have wanted to see at these sites, as opposed to the landscapes that were actually put in place. I really enjoyed this lecture when it was delivered in 2016, and I enjoy it even more now than we have to rely on our imagination to transport us to these magical, beautiful, manicured gardens of Northumberland. So uh, let's enjoy nature together and um, enjoy your lecture. Thanks. Good evening. I'm very glad to see you all here because I, I was a bit worried because I realised I clashed with paper off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the football too, so that's a pretty big demographic. Um, yes, Kirk Holt, Annick and Rossley, his three Northumberland commissions. His name's linked to other places in, in Northumberland, but these are the only three that we've got good evidence for. Um, just in case you don't know, Kirk Cole is here, Warrington is just next door here. Rothley is on, in the, the northeast corner of the Warrington estate, about four miles up that way, and um, I assume you all know where Annie is. <coughs> uh, the aim of this talk is to use these three landscapes to try and uh, get better understanding of Brown and um, what he did. So I'm not so interested in, in what happened at these two places as much as I'm interested in what Brown wanted to happen, particularly um, how he wanted these three bits of Northumberland to look. You know, just bear with me while I master the technology. Uh, this is a very bare chronology. <coughs> Until he was 23, he worked at Kirkcarl, and the owner at the time was undertaking a massive program of estate improvements while Brown was there. Gardening, farming, building, forestry. So it was a brilliant grounding for Brown for his later career. By 1757, he was famous enough to be lampooned in a play in London. And at in the 1760s, he was immensely successful. It's been calculated that for Blenheim, in construction costs and fees, he received <coughs> over 30 million pounds in today's money. Um, there he is. There are two portraits of Brown. The other one. He's wearing a black coat and a white stock and a wig. This one, much less formal. He's got a loose green coat and his natural hair. And if there's one, if there's one word that you associate with Brown, it's the word natural. And I'm sure he was aware of the message this image was giving of him. If he's a plain man, from the north, where all the best gardens were thought to come from, and um, a man of the soil. And 
just going to very quickly look at sort of Brown the man and, and his <coughs> work before moving on to the three North London landscapes. These are a few contemporary comments about Brown. And I think the word, whoops, sorry, that's the wrong one. The word perform in, up there is interesting because I think a visit from Brown was an event. It was a sort of performance. And he was a bit of a performer. And his magic wand is another interesting <coughs> it, it was as if people couldn't work out what it was that he did. His touch was so light. Uh, and it's puzzling when we think of places like Lenin that you can understand what he did. But, uh, the last one, the magic hand of Brown, is from Hodgson in the historian of Northumberland. He's writing 50 years later, almost certainly without, without being aware of this, because this was in a private letter, and he uses exactly the same kind of language. <coughs> this is from a London newspaper, <coughs> and I think the word vanity is a little bit unfair. Brown was undoubtedly a bit touchy, a bit sensitive about how he was treated. Because, um, and it's not surprising, considering he came from a relatively humble background and he was mixing with extremely wealthy, powerful people. Uh, Pitt, the Prime Minister, who is his friend, wrote recommending Brown to a friend, uh, and he said, the chapter of my friend's dignity must not be omitted. He signs himself the squire, dines regularly with his neighbour at Sion, that's the Duke of Northumberland, and shares the private hours of the king. The third one kind of explains why I might have been a bit touchy about how he was treated. Uh, <coughs> But the last one is much more typical. He gave advice not just on landscape, but on interior design. Um, he was thought to be a bit of a sort of polyman uh, and a man of impeccable taste. Uh, those, the two great men of Lute and, and Hayes, are picked up on the Earl of Butte, two prime ministers, both of whom were on work. Now, a quick look at his sort of style. This is just one quotation about one of his landscapes. And I've chosen it for two things. It mentions conifers, and Brown used a lot of conifers, but they don't usually survive. And so we get a rather <coughs> slanted view of what a Brown landscape <coughs> might have looked like. Also, in a pretty flower base, we don't usually associate Brown with that, but he did, but mostly for this the effect of a long perspective and considerable space. He seemed to have the ability to play with our sense of perspective, um, our sense of space. And that sort of harks back to the, the sort of magic wand um, quotation. These are the steward's notes from Burton Constable, North of Hull. The Brown would visit to give his advice, and the steward would take notes. This is just a selection. There's pages and pages of them, but they're a very valuable glimpse into Brown and what he was up to. So I'll whiz through. The first one <coughs> um, shows you his, his way of treating avenues. If, if they cut across the view line, <coughs> he would clump them, he not holes in them. And also it <coughs> tells us that the view was from the gallery window, and that's a key point to grasp about Brown. <coughs> he was mainly take, um, um, making little landscape <coughs> pictures to be seen through the windows from the main rooms of the house. Obviously he was doing other stuff too, but that's key, I think. So the second one, it's another view, but this time it's over a shrubbery. And the third one is extremely interesting. 
breaking the side of the hill must be earth moving. And that was the other. I mean, he made his landscapes with trees and, and with earth. Uh, <laughs> it's quite convoluted, isn't it? To the right and the top of the hill, to the left from the place where Mr. Brown stood. But the interesting bit is this opening of light. I'm not sure what it means, but it does show that Brown was looking at the landscape as a sort of painter light. And the view was under the canopy of the trees. There's another view here, and this one, <coughs> he's knocking a hole in a, in a plantation to let a view through. But this is interesting because the end bit, not before by any means, dare not touch till then. And that's not an unusual attitude that Stuart he came across, didn't seem to know quite what to make of him. And he was treated with a mixture of awe and, and sort of mockery. Uh, but I think this is the price he paid for living in London and working <coughs> north of Hull. Because <coughs> he found it very difficult to keep control of the works. So he had to make it absolutely clear that his instructions must be you know, strictly adhered to. Another opening for a view, this time from a seat out in the park. Another view seen through trees from the breakfast room steps. So they all show him creating these very specific little landscape pictures. He's kind of refining the advice he would, he would give on one of his plans, down to quite um, close sort of detail. Uh, and lastly, the, this is advice for the, the trees to be planted. I and mean, it's quite sort of general. Uh, take away the ash trees and plant to better kinds. And that's a common plant. So <coughs> it looks like uh, the, the basic sort of background planting wasn't that um, sort of sensitive. You could use any of these. But I, I assume that when it came to the sort of focus of the landscape, the single important trees, he would probably mark them on the spot and um, you know, say which species plant. Just very quickly going to look at a brown plan. This is Temple Dewsum and the house is down here. This is the very sort of top of the park. I just want to sort of rattle very quickly through a few of the details. Firstly these little clumps, they're all conifers, they're quite regularly spaced. Perhaps not something you might expect in a, in a landscape by someone who's supposed to make you know, amazingly natural landscapes. Ditto this. Is that a natural feature? I think so. <coughs> um, it's quite puzzling, actually, because this one doesn't go all the way, and this one has a bend in it. Um, <coughs> I'd like to just point out that a sort of bow tie shaped bit of. Uh, so the looser planting than the rest of the belt, presumably part of the view from the house, which is down here, up this way, different sort of texture to the belt, and also when you're travelling on this drive, you would get a, a different view through the through the wider space the trees. The point I'm going to make with this is that even his plans go huge amount of sort of detail and um, this is a bit the same plan. The house is here. Um, this is the whole half. He liked to make divided views <coughs> and here's a, a good example. This is a bit of the belt densely planted and that bit of the belt acts to create a divided view from the house. This way it's very open scatter of trees here, a few trees here, no trees here. The other direction is this way, and it goes through 
a loose planting of trees, and it's sort of forced between these two clumps, and it probably ends here, because the, the belt is sort of dense there. So you've got two contrasted views, and that's something he often did. So that's Brown's plan for Kirk Carl. Um, the three Northumberland landscapes, you can, you can connect them. They all have a personal connection to Brown. For Kirk Hall, it's obvious. Um, at Annick, he was working for the Duke in London and going to dinner with him. And um, Rothley was Sir Walter Blackett, who Brown would have known all his life. Um, <coughs> All three suffer from the distance from London. London was about three, three days away by coach. And it would be very difficult for Brown to sort of keep on top of things. He used to try and organize his work so that he would do a sort of northern campaign, he called them, and he would try and fit in as many places as he could. If you go down the A1, there's one brown landscape after another. But it would be difficult. At Anik, he was able to put his own foreman in place, um, who had a work team of between 50 and 60 men at Anik. Uh, at Kirk Carl, it didn't really arise, because not much happened at Kirk Carl. Um, but roughly, he was at the mercy of the Wallington Estate team, for <coughs> That included his brother George, so I think things weren't too bad. So, um, oh, uh, sorry, go on. All three involved his, his sort of river lakes. So this is the one at Kirk Carl along the Serpentine, winding through the low ground, east of the land. And roughly, he made a lake at the Ranker River. And the Danic, he was dealing with a real river. Um, sort of making it more of a river. <coughs> where he worked there with James Brindley, the canal engineer. Um, and lastly, all three are linked by this road, which is the Aylmer to Hexham Turnpike, started in 1750. And it goes from Kirk Hall to Wallington, and then through Rothley to Annick. So um, even though not, not, not much got done here, I'm going to look quite closely at this plan, for what it tells us about Brown and the capabilities that he saw in the, the Kirkall landscape. So the house is there. Uh, here's his lake. There's a, there's a belt. And the usual sort of scatter of trees in front of the belt to soften the hard edge. It's got clumps, single trees, wall garden, a semicircular approach. This is the Beach Avenue, which I assume is an existing feature that the Brown wanted cat. <coughs> and it's there's a sort of dotted lines underneath it, which is the existing landscape. Most of his plans are based on a um, survey of the existing. That's, so Kirk Card is down here, Simon side, and the Wellington is over here. This, that's the sole surviving beach shoot from the Beach Avenue, <coughs> photographed by Joe Cornish. That's the, that's the house at Kirk Carl that the plan was drawn for. And I'm just going to look more closely at the plan. So this is, it shows uh, four kinds of trees. These are his sort of broad leaves. It shows conifers. And then it shows these sort of bushes, which I think must be existing trees that he wanted kept. And then by the water, he has sweeping willows. Weeping willows were newly introduced to England in the, in the mid-18th century. 
as I mentioned, the Brands plan is drawn on top of a survey of the existing, and uh, here's the house here. I'm sure this must have been the old formal gardens at the Kirk Hall, where Brown would have worked as a lad. And he's, he's now saying, I think uh, in the margin of the plan it says, the dotted lines are buildings, etc., to be taken away. So they were, this was all to go. I've drawn a sort of rough sketch based on those dotted lines showing what the formal gardens might have been like. Um, and I've also drawn on Brown's Lake just to give you a sense of how it sort of fitted with the existing landscape. And it, it, this is the Kirkham Burn, which is still there today. Uh, and it's quite interesting the way it, how closely the lake sort of fitted with the existing layout. So, we're still at Kirk Hall, the house here, the, the lake. Um, I began by saying that I wanted to get as close as possible to how Brown wanted Kirk Hall to look. And the best way of doing this is Brown's plan. But the plan needs interpreting. It needs converting into the, the landscape pictures that Brown had in his mind when, when he drew the plan. So I've had a stab at doing that. <coughs> I've chosen what I consider to be the three main views that Brown was trying to make. Conventionally, you would have three views from the house, one this way, one this way, one that way, with the fourth front of the house being the back and, and no views. So this is the east front of the house and the view from it. And, I, and I, it's this area here between the two green cones that I'm interested in. And I'm interested in because this is the, this is the this is the view that would have the lake in it. And the lake is the single most expensive feature on Brown's plan. And because the ground is so flat, and, and the house is almost on the same sort of level as the lake, <coughs> where the lake crossed uh, at sort of right angles to the line, it's like you wouldn't really see it. So this, you would just see this long <coughs> stretch of the water here. So I've tried to recreate Brown's views uh, with sketches. So with great trepidation, I move on to my sketches. Um, so this is a photograph of the view from the east front of the house. A few years back now, because this has changed quite a lot since. But this, this is where the formal gardens were, and Brown's Lake would have would have wound over this flat ground here. Uh, so the, the ground between the house and the lake would be a hay meadow. That's this area here. And, and then here's the lake. A belt on the, on the ridge up here. Scatter of some groups of trees in front of the belt to um, sort of break the hard edges of the hard edge of the belt, and here's his approach coming in. This, the approach would be better hidden than I've shown it, because it was a given in a brown landscape that you wouldn't <coughs> see any, any roads or any fences, because they sort of cut across the landscape. I've half hidden it, but all it needs is a sort of holly planted here, and it's, it's successfully hidden. And brown, on the plan, he actually shows some groups of trees the wood of it, isn't it? Well, I want to talk about it a bit, so I haven't been here to um, uh, Two huge caveats of this sketch. Firstly, I'm not an artist. Secondly, I'm not KVT Brown. Uh, and he stressed the vital importance of 
um, the very careful positioning of the trees and the very careful choice of species for form and foliage colour to create those kind of visual effects that we saw at Binmere earlier on. So I see these as, as sort of cartoons, but it's a very useful exercise. I've t taken that photograph and I've sort of put the trees from Brian's plan onto it and sort of drawn it up with a sketch. And I, it works quite well. It's quite a conventional brown landscape, really. It's got all the elements you might expect. It's got a lake, it's got a belt, it's got the scatter of trees in front of the belt, it's got clumps. Uh, and I think it, it would be a rather beautiful landscape. It didn't happen. Uh, I've just drawn those two just to get a sense of the scale of change that Brown was proposing. It was going from the top one to the bottom one. Next, the view south is the house again, the view up this way. Again, it's, it's this view here that is interesting. And the interest in this view for Brown was the road. Not the road itself, because the road must never be seen, but passing traffic on it. I think the angle of this, this wood bound here is interesting. I mean, it sort of shows the, the splay that he was interested in. This is the, that's the road into Kirkhall, which Brown wanted taken away. It didn't happen. And if you go to Kirkhall today, that's the way you go. Uh, so my sketch, this is the view Today, there's the road. That's actually the, that single surviving beach tree. So I've done the same. I've, I've taken, <coughs> taken the trees off Brown's plan and added them to the, to the photograph and sort of drawn it up. So there's his approach coming in, and again, this would have been much better hidden than I've drawn it. And then I've sort of Kirkpile has migrated to the tropics. But this is the same picture, but I've isolated sort of key bits. So there's the road with a passing stagecoach on it. Quarry wagons today. Those are the, that's the Beach Avenue. Because only the last two trees would be seen in the Beach Avenue because it runs directly away from the house. And I, that could be one reason why it was kept, because it didn't cut across the view, it wasn't a problem. Also, I do wonder if the avenue wasn't planted by Brown when he was allowed, and it would be the right sort of date. Um, so it's possible that he kept it for sentimental reasons. What I want to say about this is it's a very it's a sort of formal composition, straight lines, trees, groups of conifers that sort of vaguely balance each other symmetrically, a formal avenue running to the road. And you would expect the most formal landscaping would be on, on the entrance front of the house, and this is the entrance front. Uh, and the, the wood, there would be a fence here. Today, there's a sort of harbour if you dig around on the side of the road. Um, but it's very like the effect you get at the Wallington. You stand on the east, at the house looking across the east lawn at Wallington. You can see the cars passing at the end of the lawn by the dragon's stones, uh, which is a sort of slight suggestion that perhaps Brown advised that Wellington was wrong. Then lastly, the view out to the west. Here's the house. Um, this, I'm almost certain, was another avenue. Um, <coughs> 
bank it had gone by the time Brown drew the plan, but, he's, but the banks are drawn on. And in fact, the banks survive today, and just people still see them in the, in the field. So this side of the house is, is mainly conserved with Wall Garden, which is in the valley of uh, Kirkconnell Burn. It's mostly on the north side of the burn, on the south-facing slope, but it straddles the valley. The burn has been made into a pool in the middle of the garden. The garden is screened by this shrubbery planting here, which I'm sure would have been sort of shrubbery because it's because there's a walk from the house to the garden, so it would have been kind of ornamental planting. But <coughs> you mustn't see the garden, so it's screened. There's an interesting little break in the screen there on, on the line of this main path through the garden, and I'm, I'm sure that was left to give a view from the, the glass houses here out into this bit of apartment room. So, and lastly, he, he leaves a gap at the end of the avenue there, which we'll come back to. That's the photograph of the of that view, and it suffers from too much light. And there's a nice sketch. So the wall garden is in here, with this sort of scatter in front of it. Here's, I've sort of drawn the avenue on, so you can talk about it. In case you wonder, these are sheep. <laughs> um, but what, I, I wonder here, this is the gap that I just mentioned at the end of the avenue. Uh, and this is actually pretty much due west. So at the equinox, the sun would set there, and light would flood into the landscape. And I wonder whether that's something like his opening of light that we came across at um, the Urban Festival. So those are the three main views at um, Kirk Hall, and they're, they're all different, that's the first thing. And each, each of the views kind of responds to the landscape over which it was laid out. And I think, um, I think it, I think it's a good design. I think he's he's um, he's shown his abilities at Kurt Hall, I think. So lastly, what got done? I'm oh, sorry, my back. So, <laughs> um, so this is um, Brown's design, it's drawn onto a modern plan. Here's his lake. This is a six nine six which was seen in the 1820s by Thomas Telford. Uh, so the lake didn't get done, but, uh, sorry, this is, what, this, this is what happened. So there's no lake, but that bit of belt seems to have got done, a bit of a belt around the, the north of the park seems to have got done, some of this planting here, a little bit, that little bit of the, of his, semicircular approach got done. The house, <coughs> the Lorraines went bankrupt in the 1820s. This house was, the estate was sold and this house was pulled down. Uh, and that, that's the kitchen wing, that's all that's left of the car today. Roughly, um, this is the Turnpike Road. There's two lakes. This is the high lake to the west of the road and the low lake to the east. The road, um, the road runs between them on a, a causeway. The high lake drains out to the west, this way. The low lake drains out to the east and the Usley Burn. So the road is on the watershed between the two lakes. Quite a neat engineering feat, I think. Rothley was Sir Walter Beckett's 
second landscape. He had he had Wellington, um, <coughs> where he did a lot of stuff. But Wellington's a much gentler landscape than Rotley. Uh, I think at Rotley he was exploring the possibilities of a different kind of landscape. He had all, he had all sorts of things going on at Rotley. This is this is Rotley Deer Park on the top of it where he built a sham castle, which you probably know, Rothley Castle, designed by Daniel Garrett and built by George Brown, Lancelot's brother. Codger's Fort was there, he had the two lakes. The high lake was made first. And maybe by Brown, uh, but there's no evidence to say whether it is. The low lake came second and is definitely by Brown. <clears throat> he also had a sort of triumphal gateway up here, but, which is one of the one of the highest bits of the Wellington Estate. It's, it's long gone, and we don't know what it looked like, but the footings are still there. He also commissioned loads of, sort of follies from William Newton, only one of which was built, I think, uh, and classical facades to be added to the Wallington farmhouses, which again didn't happen. Um, it's a photograph by Joe Cornish. That's the view from the new law. There's Codger's Fort on its crag. The lakes are down here, hidden by trees now, it might have been um, visible in the 18th century. There's Rothley Castle in Rothley Park and the Wellington Estates spread out. So, um, <coughs> this is what would be called a sublime landscape. I think that's what Sir Walter Blackett was interested in exploring with his work at Rothley. So this is the landscape that Brian was asked to contribute his lake to. It also strikes me that it, in Northumberland, he was working with amazing raw material. Uh, that's, that's a fantastic landscape, isn't it? Well, most his sort of bread and butter were rather tame landscapes in the Thames Valley. Um, in fact, he was particularly good at you know, making boring landscapes interesting. Uh, in Northumberland, he had a different problem to confront. So, this is Brown's, he, he, he drew five drawings for Rossi. This is his sort of master plan. They're dated 1770. So here's the High Lake, as I say, which that was done first. This is the Turnpike Road. And here's Brown's Low Lake. So his problem here was to was to make a lake that sort of read as continuous with the existing High Lake. And he had he had various uh, he had various ways of doing that, which we will come to. So the drawing shows his lake. It shows this circular planting which has a garden on this side, and that's coach house and stables, that says there. So then a banqueting house, which he calls the room, which is here, and a drive running around the lake, his sort of, his rockwork bridge, which we'll come to here, and then groups of trees. Um, right, so that's the banqueting house that he was going to build. And it was, this is the room, I, I, I think these would have been kitchens, for the preparation of the food, and this was the entrance here. The key bit of the banqueting house was this bay in the south front, and the bay would give 
three views, one straight ahead and two off to each side. Uh, it's a view of the lake and the surrounding landscape. Uh, <coughs> this is a photograph of Rothley Low Lake from the road, and the tent stands on the site where Brown is going to build the banqueting house. He produced a drawing for this rockwork bridge, which was to go here. There's the low lake, there's the high lake, there's the road. So this was to go here. And it was intended to help the two lakes read as one. So it kind of read as if there was water playing beneath the bridge between the two lakes. Um, and it's a funny one, because he's both creating the illusion that it's a bridge and, you know, and the two lakes are linked. In fact, the low lake is about two metres lower than the high lake. At the same time, he's, he's showing that it's not an illusion. It's a, that he's sort of showing his workings. And it's, clearly not a, it's clearly not a bridge. It's odd sort of game he seems to be playing. He produced a drawing for the end the east end of the lake, so the bridge is up this end, up here. And this this drawing concerns this bit of the lake here, really. It says a sketch for the a sketch for the head of the intended piece of water. This is the head. And the the earth to be taken away from the banks to give it this form. And the head to be made twenty-five feet wide. So the lake was made with a, with a bit of earth moving, <coughs> um, possibly just down this end. It's very hard to spot this kind of earth moving, um, so you can't say for certain what got done. But it shows the end of the lake turns, so it created the impression that it was carrying on. So the bridge at the other end made it look like it was continuous with the high lake, and then the, this bend at the bottom made it look as if it was going on. So this is one of his, his sort of rivers. And again, it's based on a survey of the existing landscape. This, this is, these are probably his old field boundaries. Almost certainly surveyed by his brother George, who, who was the surveyor at Wallington. And a drive and the trees are partly a part of the view from the banqueting house, but also they're controlling the views of, of the drive. So it comes along here as it emerges past the trees. Here you get a view down the lake. And again, I think at this point here you get a view down the lake. Um, so back to my sketches. So here's the low lake photograph from the site of the banking house. Uh, and I've, again, I've taken this photograph and I've added the trees of Brown's drawings to it. Uh, and I struggle to find things to say about the trees. I think they're there to help uh, tie the lake into the surrounding landscape. To, to help with the views from the drive, there's sort of the right you can have more. Um, and also the views from the banking house. And I think that conifer is significant. That's on, on the plan, I'm taking that off the plan. I think conifers were dark foliage, and it was a kind of painterly convention to use dark trees close to the viewpoint to provide a bit of um, frame for the view. It's called a repoussoir. Um, you go from dark to light in the distance and it's supposed to help give a sense of sort of depth. And Brown did use these sort of painterly techniques. Um, yes. This is the very bottom of the lake, and I've 
this is where the dam would have been. I put this in because in the 1870s they put a railway through on this massive causeway embankment. So it's this bottom end of the lake has been rather destroyed. Brown's dam would have only been a few feet high, I think. Uh, and I think there would have been a sort of visual link with, with the valley beyond, which is planted with sort of lime trees. So it's you know it's kind of landscape. But that's that's been lost with this big embankment. Those are second walls, which could well be 18th century. That could be the only bit of planting that got done at the road lake. So that's, this is the view south, the view straight ahead. Codgers Fort on its crag, the road here. And, and views straight ahead were usually sort of less interesting than the sort of oblique views. Uh, and that's sort of true here, I think, too. So there's my sketch. Codgers, Codgers, uh, and the planting taken from Brown's plan. Uh, <coughs> he puts a clump on the sight line from the planting house to <coughs> Codgers, and that's something he sometimes did as well, He's, as if he wanted to give a sort of platform for the folly to sit on. I don't know for certain, but that possibly what determines that, that group of trees there. And lastly, the view to the west, which is the most important of the three. This is the view that has the bridge and the high lake. Uh, <coughs> and there was actually a little There's a little 18th century building in, in there, which is, the footings are still there, the National Trust took it down in the 1980s for some odd reason. Uh, <coughs> and there's no, I haven't seen a picture, I don't know exactly what it looked like. So there's my sketch, there's the little building. There's the bridge, there's the, there's the high lake, and like the low lake, you can't see the ends of the high lake, so it looks again like it's carrying on. Uh, <coughs> in the 18th century, there was a, a there was a sort of lawn on the high lake sort of here, which the Trevelyans planted up when they when they inherited. And in the summer, Walter Black put a tent up on the lawn. And I think the banking house was partly meant to. Uh, to replace the tent. And again, with this view, there's another conifer, which I think is doing the same as the other one. Dark foreground tree to give perspective and depth to the view. Uh, the, I've drawn in the edges of the bay windows, because that's how it worked. The window frames would provide the picture frame. And I've made it into a, a sort of hanger there, which, again, is a kind of educated guess. This is some of the correspondence about the lakes. Uh, <coughs> the boat ordered. They actually ordered five brass cannon for Codgers Fort to be fired when the lake was filled. Here's George. So Sir Walter is um, instructing them to get ahead and get gets going with the low lake. Uh, and they obviously did. But then Mr. Duffield puts his oar in, I think. £2,000 is a lot of money, as he says. I think it's something like probably £100,000 in today's 
and, and, and I did wonder with this if there wasn't a little bit of professional jealousy. And that thing of a prophet is no without honour, say, in his own country, with a brown coming back up north. They all would have known him as a lad. And suddenly he's a friend of the king and signs himself a squire and calls himself a gentleman. And whether they're a bit obstructive, anyway. The lake did get postponed. Uh, it could be that Walter Blackett was running out of money in the 1770s. Uh, and it could be that he just had to stop and he died in 1777. Um, so what in the, the Rothley project was, was sort of unfinished. Another one of Joe's beautiful photographs. It's the low lake and the high lake there. And, and Lake House is just visible here. Uh, so, this is from the bottom end. There's Codgers for the high lake up here. The banking house would have been built on this knoll here. So the lake got done. The banking house didn't. I think a lake house, which was built by the, the Trevelyans, it probably took its inspiration from Brown's banking house, but put in a different place. Uh, <coughs> virtually none of the planting got done. But it's a pretty amazing lake, I think. Considering, I think it's just a question of choosing the height of the dam and the exact positioning of the dam, because he had to get the water level up, so high enough so that it could read as you know, part of the high lake. Um, that was the skill of it. And perhaps a little bit of taking earth away from the banks to give this fall. I don't think it could be this side, which is kind of rock, um, but perhaps on this side. But I think we'll never know. Um, they actually look I've got not much to say about that. So, Annick. I have to admit I know less about Annick than I know about the other two. No brown plan has been found for Annick. <clears throat> and although the Duke paid Brown huge sums of money, it's not the payments for work at Scion aren't distinguished from payments for Annick, so it's difficult to know the, the full extent of what went on at Annick under Brown's control. This is a plan of uh, 1760. Whoops, sorry, okay. um, Here's the castle. This is this is the elm winding through the park. At this date, uh, the ground overlook from the castle was fields with some farm buildings. There was a road, public road along the river. The Duke didn't own these enclosures here. But some landscaping had been done. Little circular clumps on the hilltops and a belt around the edge of the landscape. And I strongly suspect that this is sort of Brown's first go at Annick, um, <coughs> his first campaign. So this is 1788, so this is post-Brown. There's the castle. So the fields have all gone. The farm's been taken down, the road's been closed. Those are the two clumps, pre-existing clumps, and that's the pre-existing belt. But lots more planting has been done. Other additional sort of belt, a few other additional belts being put in. We put the two together, they're both 
conserve the same area. So there's before and there's after. And I'm sure that's, <coughs> that's all Brown's contribution. Again, that's before the castle's a bit of a wreck. The, the ground between the castle and the river is a bit of a wreck. The river banks are all covered in scrub. The river's full of boulders and, uh, and after. Castle beautifully repaired by Robert Adam. The banks all smooth and clean. The river banks cleared of scrub. The river cleared of boulders. A boat bought to sail up and down the river. So this is the description of a walk through the Barneyside. Barneyside is where the Annick Gardens are, on that side of the castle. And it's a description of a walk through a brown landscape. And it, it sounds lovely. It's a gravel walk, with shrubs and flowers. Sometimes the walk's enclosed, sometimes it's, it's more open. There's a view of a corn mill with castellated walls and a bridge, and it ends up on a hill with a, with a seat with a lovely view. The, the river has its cascades, which are made by Brown and James Brindley, the canal engineer, who worked on it with Brown. And the ground is planted. Beautified with plants and single trees, most tastefully disposed of the brown. <coughs> and that's the. Here's the walk here on the map. That's the Gothic Mill, and there's the bridge, and the seat is on. It's actually shown on that, <coughs> on that hill there. And the main. The main view, like the, the, the landscape is uh, designed to just improve the view from the castle, but there would have been more important bits of the view. I think that's the, that's the key view, because it's from the castle down to the mill and the bridge and the river with the cascade there. And um, Adam built two sort of prospect rooms in the castle for this view, and he built a seat, I think it's called the Hotspur seat, um, somewhere on the walls as well, <coughs> in the view. Uh, so there, that's the mill, there's, there's the castle. <coughs> there's one of Brindley's cascades, there's another. Uh, but the view is actually the other way around, I think. It's from the castle down to the mill, that's the most important one. And that's taken from an old Annick Castle guide book, but it does show that the mill was down here, it's, it's long gone, and there's the bridge. <coughs> the river, which was, was raised up, it was converted into a sort of river where capital letters by the um, Cascades, considerably raised the height of it. <coughs> this is the high ground that the walk um, wound along, and that's the hill <coughs> with the seat on it. And uh, this is, I think it's called Denick, and that's also planted with Clumps on the on the hills and a sort of belt on the high ground, all I think by Brown. Everything in view from the castle was landscape, um, almost certainly by Brown. And now I should go to Hulm Park, you know, to up upstream from the castle, <coughs> and that also was landscaped at this. Uh, here's, here's the Priory, 
I think that's supposed to be grisly time, I think. Uh, and Brown was almost certainly probably involved in Harlem Park too, but it's hard to say. Thomas Cole, the, the, Duke's, the Duke's gardener, might have been some more responsible for the work in Harlem Park than Brown, with sort of Brown keeping a, a perhaps keeping an overview. There were big plans for Holland Park. A 200-acre lake was go going to be made up, upstream, actually around the corner here, overlooked from the Priory, where Robert Adler made a, a sort of beautiful little sort of banqueting room with, with a view that would have taken that would have been of this 200 acre lake, which probably would have been, you know, that could well have been Brown's um, involvement of lakes for his speciality, but <coughs> uh, the lake wasn't, the lake was never made. That's, that's Hong Priory, and um, I'd say Brown worked there with Adam Brown, is supposed to made it a garden within the primary walls. So that's the three landscapes. Um, and I'll just end up with a few comments about them. I think if I'd asked you at the start what feature you most associate with Brown, I suspect a lot of you would have mentioned a ha ha. And strictly speaking, there isn't a ha ha in any of those landscapes. He's not nearly as predictable as, as he sometimes made out to be. Um, he was a man of his time, so the landscapes are full of Gothic buildings, Gothic bridges, and Gothic trees, like in a wide range of species, a lot of conifers. Um, but I don't think anyone would deny that um, the Rothley Lake is very beautiful. By the end of the 18th century, they would have been a bit dubious about the banqueting house and the bridge. But Brown was making um, making landscapes sort of full of illusion and fantasy. I did wonder whether you could say he, he, he made sort of natural landscapes, but not real ones. But I'm, I don't want to go down that road. Um, and lastly, I'd just say he was, he was immensely brave, or, or very arrogant, I suppose, the other view. These three landscapes, he was proposing a really radical change, complete transformation. Uh, Kurt Carl from the sort of formal gardens to that um, sort of flowing landscape that we looked at. Uh, roughly a wild moorland in which he sticks a great big river and a vanic which converts the conventional sort of farmland into the fairly um, stunning Parkland landscape that partially still survives today. That's, that's me done, I think. Thank you, Nick. I'm sure there'll be many questions, but could I ask Grace <coughs> McCombie to, to begin the discussion, please? Ooh. There's a microphone coming, Grace. Yes, now. Oh, that's the truly You put us there, and there in the And yes, when you go there, you don't really feel it quite like that. We've got to see it again for your life. 
If you wish to ask a question, could you put your hand up and the staff will come to you with a microphone. So, could I have another lady over here, please? When Graham wrote that he was planning a plantation and that it should later on be thinned, but not until the trees had grown, does that imply after his death, when he would therefore no longer be in charge? <sighs> No, I, it's, it's a very good um, question. And I have a problem with people who say, weren't they marvellous, you know, planting stuff that they would never ever see. But I don't think that was true. They were as keen as we are to see instant landscape. Uh, they would conventionally plant trees that big. And, and Brown was known for planting you know, sort of 20 foot, 30 foot high trees. Actually, the trees on my sketches, I deliberately <coughs> made them the height they would be within some 10, 20 years of being planted. So if you think you're planting trees that big, you just need to wait sort of five years. And, and that's I think, that when you start you know, knocking holes in them. We just get this sort of view that the landscape has to be composed of you know, great big 200 year old trees. I don't think it did. I think they wanted it to look, that's, that looks kind of new landscape, doesn't it, on my sketches. And I think that's what they wanted. I mean, they wanted a sort of new looking landscape. It was all, it was all new. Yes. <coughs> I've just written a, a, a little a piece in, in the Northumbria Gardens Trust journal on that point. 
Because I don't know what it means. Uh, because in the one, um, Northumberland's got all sorts of different kind of landscape in it. What exactly was he copying? Uh, <coughs> Petworth. He was so, one thing that I can agree with, he was very good at handling you know, the, the big scale. He did little landscapes of you know, five acres, but he, he was very good with the sort of blendings and petworths where the scale is huge. <coughs> And that might have been a, a legacy from his upbringing or something where it, you know, it is a big landscape in Northumberland, and there's not a sky and all that. It's a wide open landscape. But it's very, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a nice thought, but I don't know whether you can ever be any more certain about it. Yes, maybe. There seem to be lots of landscapes which have never actually been achieved. Was um, Brown very ambitious? Did he did he bankrupt his patrons, or was he just unlucky? Um, he's supposed to have done about two hundred and fifty. I don't know how many of those ones. Um, just nothing happened. Not that many. I think. He he was. He seems to be a workaholic. Could, I mean, he's permanently away from home, on the road. He, he, some of his clients might have gone bankrupt, but you can blame him for that, I don't know. He wasn't that expensive. I mean, his, his fees were, I suppose, some relatively expensive. The landscaping wasn't hugely expensive, except for lakes, perhaps. And, it's always kind of reckoned that his landscapes were quite economic. They sort of um, they were much supposed to be much cheaper than the formal gardens that they replaced. They they provided a crop of grass, a crop of hay. You know, they they kind of worked as a sort of farming landscapes. That was I think that was <coughs> his inheritance from you know, from his upbringing at Kirkland. He was very good with the sort of practical the sort of farming side of things. Uh, I wondered whether so having I thank you very much by the way it was it was a really interesting sort of enlightening talk. The um having spent more time than me and capability around this landscape so I wondered whether you could Perhaps tell us about how they are propositional moving forward. It always seems to me that the work that happened before Brown through William Kent and Spitzer and after Brown through Oofdale Price and uh, Payne Knight is somehow <coughs> more propositional in that there's a negotiation between an existing set of circumstances or there's a negotiation between the formal and the natural. And I always struggled to see in Brown's work a future, even though they're these very beautiful absolute landscapes. I'm not sure I entirely understand. You know, yeah, I, I think in the way they're protected as well, I mean, the Brown landscapes are, it seems like he's aiming for beauty. And I found it really interesting, your reading of this landscape philosophy is perhaps part of Beckett's intention to make a sublime landscape is really interesting. But, I just wondered, ahead of the absolute compositions, uh, frame views, and um, you know, very almost provisional relationship between room and landscape. Beyond that, when you're there and you're spending time in these places, this bodily experience of landscape. How how are they propositional? How can we have it as designers? How can we see them as having perhaps a future or helping us to design? Um, that the, the sort of pain might not who were very critical of Brown, uh, they kind of won the argument. And it's their kind of, that kind of wild, you know, Wordsworth, Lake District, Second Wales, that picturesque landscape that we, we think of as a sort of beautiful landscape. <coughs> and Brown's landscape were criticised for having a sort of man-made, artificial quality. It's difficult to know what to say because I don't know they 
brown landscape today that looks you know, remotely like it was intended to look. Because um, <coughs> 250 years, awful lot has changed. And our aesthetic has changed. As I say, we struggle to see his kind of landscape as just in any way natural. We, I, um, my kids used to get a taxi to the school bus, and the taxi driver was a very nice guy, but he was always throwing his bag package out the window. And we asked him once you know, why he, he did it. Didn't you think he was destroying a, you know, messing up a beautiful landscape? And he hadn't realised this is this is another time. He thought the Lake District was beautiful, uh, but he just lived in the North Time and it was, it was a working place. So. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm not really answering your question. It's I, know, I think it's a, it's a tough one. It's, it's, it's a tough one to answer. I really want to see the future in them, but I can't help but admire them as landscapes from the past. There. I think they should absolutely be protected and they're very valuable in what they're trying to do. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps what? The, the, the 18th century, they were completely into that, that sort of fantasy. You know, they were sort of a theatrical landscape. And they, they would go out, they would usually have a hay meadow in front of the house in the brown landscape, and they would all go out and, and, and sort of join in the hay meadow. And they were like playing at you know, being country folk and, 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 and milkmaids in the day. You know. It was all a big game. That has long, you know, we would find it very hard to get back into that mindset. Um, Any other questions? Okay, well, if I could uh, thank you, Nick, for an absolutely superb lecture this evening, bringing uh, your experienced eye and beautifully illustrated with contemporary illustrations like this. But I think also your expertise in redrawing these landscapes, and you might not think you're an artist, but I think you've really helped us to see the, the, what Brown intended to do. So I think if we could thank uh, Nick again for a fantastic lecture.